Hello and welcome, my name is Meeples, they, she, he, and this is Literally Graphic. And today is my slightly belated wrap-up review for my read-through of the Vertigo comic series, Why the Last Man. Link to my initial thoughts video in the cards. This wrap-up review will contain spoilers for the comic series and some very light discussion of the TV show. Full warning, I did not read the series because I enjoyed it. I consistently rated each volume between 1 to 2 stars out of 5. I just, for whatever reason, needed to find out what happened. Doing my background research, while I definitely fall squarely in the minority here, nothing I'm saying here is terribly unique to me and my brain. That said, I like thinking about things I don't like as much as I like thinking about things that I like. And this is the platform I share these slots on. If you like this series, you should probably click away now. Content notes for racial slurs, homophobic slurs, male gaze, sex, nudity, biological essentialism, both in terms of gender and intelligence, Islamophobia, childhood rape, torture, character death, scenes of mass death, pregnancy, pregnancy complications, pro-colonization, substance use, and probably more things I lost track of. This is a mature title published by Vertigo between September 2002 to March 2008. Not my favorite point in pop culture of the so-called United States, especially when it comes to, quote, mature stories. Among other things, this product has not aged well. This is obviously also not a TV show review channel, so I'm not going to dig into the episodes of the TV show that have been released so far, but I did watch the first five episodes before recording this. So there will be a bit of compare and contrast. As far as the nature of the nudity and violence, it's certainly not the edgiest Vertigo title. A very talky comic, there's lots of death, both because of the mass die-off of mammals with a Y chromosome and the people left behind actively killing each other, but it lags behind even stuff like Kill Bill and Game of Thrones in gratuitous depictions of violence. A slightly more toned down version of Preacher? Question mark? The level of nudity did increase as the series went on with a couple scenes of sexposition, but it was the classic hierarchy of nudity that results in a lot of boobs, following by a smattering of full frontal vagina nudity to show we are a serious adult comic, and one lone instance of full frontal penis nudity because who wants to see that? It was very male gazy. Looking at the creator side of things, overall this series was pretty consistent throughout, which is definitely a strength. The one exception seems to be a switch in issue 18 from Pamela Rambo to Xylonal Studios on coloring. Never arguably bad, the art did improve throughout the series. It's hard for me to exactly pin it down, but there just seemed like there was more of an ease to it in the last few volumes. The writing was a bit more of a mixed bag to me. Most technically, I felt like the series was really overextended. Obviously, globe hopping after an apocalyptic event takes time, but the books are mostly an episodic series of Yorick and company running into various niche groups of people most of them themed around stereotypical costumes, many of which try to kill Yorick. Watching some interviews with Vaughn and Guerra from 2019, they talk about adding some of those stops in because they found them funny. Which was a helpful explanation because it hadn't occurred to me. I don't think this is entirely due to me being not smart, because nowhere from Goodreads to Comic Vine to Wikipedia to anywhere else does anyone else say that this is supposed to be a comedy. Obviously, this doesn't mean that nothing about this book could be funny, but I think the parts I was sp supposed to find funny because otherwise they don't make much sense, make up at least 50% of the story. I also felt like the character development could have been pushed up a notch. In contrast, I found the TV show to be developing the ever-growing roster of characters of interest in a way that is smooth, believable, and not so much based around stereotypes. The tone is also more consistent, and they seem to be foregoing the humor that I really don't get. As far as gender goes, what can I say? With very little exception, the series was as bad on gender as I thought it would be. All men, and only men, die. Because men have Y chromosomes. A few trans men are referenced. A few appear. All are misgendered fairly continuously. And most are killed by the turfs. The killing, either by evolutionary event or by the Amazons, is not condoned. But no one seems to really like the trans men that much. Even the people who are their partners aren't depicted fully affirming them, 
that much. Obviously making the premise seemingly kill all trans women because they have Y chromosomes, combined with all the characters referring to the event as the time all the men died, is biological essentialism that also erases all the things we don't know yet, even now, about biology as it relates to chromosomes and gender. Intersex people also don't come up at all. In the TV adaption, so far trans men have gotten a lot more positive and upfront representation. In contrast, there still seems to be huge gaps when it comes to trans women and the injustice of this very stupid premise that targets Y chromosomes, by the way, or intersex people. And I'm still left feeling that the main trans man character is going to be killed in a dramatic way sometime in the near future. One of the proposed reasons for the series is also to explore gender inequity when it comes to binary gender representation in different jobs. Most of the international intrigue revolves around which countries allowed women in the military in the early 2000s and how far women were allowed into many critical infrastructure jobs. This appears to be less of an issue in the TV show, at least so far. While ultimately the series shows that the people left behind are more than capable to rebuild the world, that seems to take a backseat to figuring out how to continue to reproduce. While cloning continues to be a hot button issue, it was having a much more public moment in the early aughts, so cloning is fairly central to people's ideas about how to continue the human species. Which also seems kind of dated, and more than a little fixated on certain people being the best. We now can, in fact, create sperm from stem cells. It would presumably still require that one last man thing, but seems like a much easier way to maintain genetic diversity. Since the astronaut's son did okay after being exposed to ampersand's droppings, it didn't seem like Yurik's entire genetic code was completely necessary. But no, we must make more copies of the good people. On a final note, Yurik is supposed to be a bit of a damsel sort of character, which is not something I disagree with, but unlike how other damsels are treated, this only seems to make Yorick and his unskilled whiny ass more central to the story arc rather than less. Also, as Vaughn has noted he largely based Yorick off of himself, it does feel rather self-flagellating at times for the, quote, last man to be such a loser. Although, I am feeling particularly annoyed with people who waste time hating themselves right now. While there is often a white feminist vibe going on that says the survivors of this mass death event are intrinsically more moral than those who died, the fact that our main characters disagree with Elson's dad, who thinks the Y chromosome is now obsolete, is some small comfort. For all I hate the patriarchy as much as the next person, I like many people who appear to have Y chromosomes. Although I gather there haven't been any widespread studies that confirm that reality actually lines up with our assumptions about certain kinds of people having either XX or XY chromosomes. Moving along to sexuality, while I wouldn't say it's great, my perspective on this has changed a bit as I made my way through the series. Thanks in large part to TERFs, I have become much more familiar with the histories of second wave feminism and radical feminism. The man-hating antagonists in the story, for instance, seem to be highly influenced by things like political lesbianism. As the story went on, people's heterosexuality also seems to have relaxed a bit, which only seems more believable as time goes on in the real world and more and more people come out as some kind of queer. The heavy male gaze, however, never let me quite feel like we had escaped heteronormativity though, and later volumes included a lot of dreams and flashbacks relating to York and Beth's relationship. Race was another weaker point of the series in my opinion. While we have a fairly diverse triad of main characters, the way that tertiary characters were addressed left a lot to be desired. A lot of cultural caricatures and heavy use of burkas to disguise both assassins and Yorick which I shouldn't have to say is extremely Islamophobic. It also doesn't help that Agent 355 is definitely a black best friend trope. It also doesn't help that Agent 355 is definitely a black best friend trope, not only protecting him, but also being a guide and mentor, who it turns out he's been secretly in love with this entire time. Then of course she dies just at the right moment to have the most emotional impact on him as possible. Indigenous characters are exoticized and colonialist governments are centered and justified. Even taking how much the world has changed in between the original publication and now, the way that they depict different cultures was a big part of why my ratings never broke into even a grudging three stars. 
Class was artfully ignored. Access to the necessities of life never seemed to be too much of an issue for our main trio. There is some discussion of food infrastructure breaking down, but almost always more in the abstract than on the page. We still manage to heavily stigmatize substance use, though, even if we feel like these people would have a chance to build back better without Y chromosomes, we can't imagine anyone starting a harm reduction and safe su- supply program, apparently. Right up there with Volume 2, where York and company stumble on a women's prison turned anti-prison utopia only to witness everything fall apart just because someone is killed. As far as ability versus disability, there is some presentation of human bodies falling short of ableist ideals. That said, Rose and her iPad are the only injury that is not quickly solved, so we can move along with the action adventure plot. I'm not the expert on these things, but the number of stab wounds that people recover from in a page or two is a bit ridiculous. Plus, the reasons given for the mass death, especially the one that seems to have turned out to be right, were completely ridiculous. To perhaps summarize my feelings on this series, some stuff was okay, some stuff was bad, and overall I just found it rather shallow and dated, which could have been okay, but I do feel like I wasn't completely silly to think that the creators were going for something a bit more profound. On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden is a much better example, among many, of actually writing a compelling story that is actually man-free. Bye y'all, keep reading and resist white supremacy. And as always, Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.